All right, guys, welcome back to another video. So in this one, I am finally taking the time to build myself a brand new, very fancy desk. So up until this point, I've been working on a desk made from pallet wood and plywood. And at this point, that desk is currently tearing itself apart because when I built it, I had no idea about things like wood movement or proper structural engineering or anything like that or joinery. So in this new desk that I'm building, I really wanted something that was both beautiful and just totally functional. And so one of the biggest constraints with this project was having a place to actually put my desktop computer. Uh, the computer that I built a few years ago is extremely large. It's got full liquid cooling on both the graphics card and the CPU. So that takes up a lot of space. And the case that I got for it has a lot of fans for a really good amount of airflow. It's a fairly high-end gaming PC. And so a typical desk from Ikea or pretty much anywhere else, or even if you look at any old traditional desk designs, none of those desks really fit the needs that I had. I needed a big open component just to keep this thing cool. So when I was designing the desk, I started in SketchUp by just putting a model of my PC. So I just made a nice big square that would fit, that was the approximate size of my computer case. From there, I built out one of the cases that's going to make up this desk. Now this desk is made up of basically four separate components. We have the left and the right cases, the main stretcher back panel that connects those two cases, and then the desktop itself. And so by starting with the case and making sure that I design it around having my PC fit in it, I can make sure that the one and only purpose of this whole project was going to be achieved. Because what I didn't want to have in the end was go and put all this time and effort into designing and building this desk all for my PC to not actually fit inside of it. Uh, that would be just about the most, the worst outcome I can possibly imagine. And so I started with that, found out all of my size constraints, figured out the best way to use up the space and still have enough airflow room around my computer. So one of the big things that I wanted to make sure of with this desk too was that it was easy to clean around. So in the past, my desks that I've used have all been very hard to you know clean up crumbs and dog hair and all that when they get built up around. So I started by keeping the cases off the ground by a good four inches. And uh, we'll be adding some curvature to the bottom stretchers, that way I can very easily fit a vacuum underneath. Uh, this also helps keep a little bit of airflow around those cases because again, especially the case that's holding my computer, is going to get quite warm. The other consideration with that is that my desk sits over a vent in my office. So I want to make sure that that vent has good airflow so that it can keep the room properly heated. But it also I want to keep the wood as far away from that vent as possible so it doesn't dry it out over time. So with those constraints in mind, I started the design. Now again, I really like traditional style furniture, which traditional style furniture is usually built very tough and very strong. So I started each case design with four solid eight quarter posts. This is going to be a very, again, very strong design and we're going to go mortise and tenon for all the joinery. So one of the things that I found while I was working on this project is white oak is a totally different beast than walnut. So in my recent, one of my recent projects, I built a trunk out of walnut and cherry. And so cutting the mortise and tenon joinery in that walnut was very simple. You cut the joint precisely to fit and I never really had any issues with, you know, looseness or things breaking out. Whereas when I tried to work in this white oak, what I found is because it's a little, because it's a little bit harder than walnut, and because it ha it's because it's an open grain wood, it's a little bit more uh, finicky to work with. And so because of that, I had to make my joints just a little bit looser. And so this was where I ran into one of my main issues with this project. And so when I started putting everything loosely together, I found that all my joints were extremely loose. They just wobbled around and weren't structurally sound. So one of the things I could have done is I could have gone back through and filled in all my mortises to make sure that I get this whole project fitting up as tightly as possible. Or I could just go through and draw bore each of the little mortise and tendon joints on this thing. And I actually really fell in love with that idea because you got a lot of little end grain details all over this piece and it looks absolutely beautiful in my opinion. The other part of this was these walnut raised panels you're seeing me install now. These panels were such an important thing in my opinion and I wanted to make sure that I had a whole bunch of these panels. Because typically when you'd see a desk done like this, you'd have you know normal your normal top and bottom stretchers connected to your post legs and then one large floating panel in between that would typically be plywood or you know might be a little bit decorative in some ways. Uh, but I'd seen a few designs of very old school desks that had a lot of these narrower panels in them. And I really liked the, the design and the idea behind it. 
because it made it a lot easier to work on. I only had to work with small panels that were very easy to work with on all the smaller machinery that I have, but it also just looked really cool and worked well with the quarter sawn walnut that I used for them. And so going back to those drawboard joints, what we're going to be doing is getting a little bit decorative with those as well. So on the main side panels, I went with just plain white oak dowels. This gives it, this makes sure that they blend into those panels really well, because all you're seeing is a little bit of white oak end grain, which is a very similar color to the white oak face grain that's everywhere else. On the post legs, I connected them with walnut dowels. This adds a little bit of contrast and just a little bit of visual interest. Now the main reason why I didn't use walnut on the side panels is just because I thought it would be too loud and it would take away from the just beautiful straight grain walnut panels that I had everywhere else on here. I didn't want a whole bunch of little dark brown dots to be making up those side panels, whereas I thought on the post legs it would look really good. And again, in the end, it does look very good. One of the other big important things with this project is I wanted this desk to be easy to move. So the back panel that you're seeing me do here is held in with a couple of threaded bolts. Now these bolts are threaded directly into the wood and make it so that with just a simple allen key I can remove those bolts and disassemble basically this entire desk. So it's super easy to move, it's all in its own individual components, and so someday if I have to move across the country, it will be very easy to just pack up this desk and bring it along with me. Unlike a lot of the other furniture I build that is very big and very solid, this desk is supposed to be easy to move. Also, at this point in the project, I introduced a brand new machine to the shop. So this is the Supermax 1630 Sudo drum sander. Now, I've wanted a drum sander basically since I found out about them because they're, what they do is it basically acts like a planer but with sandpaper. So you can take off very small amounts and it does a great job of finishing work. So as you guys have seen in the other projects that I've done, I have this design style that I really like. That I, I think I can call it like a step design or something where I have basically an outer thickness, I add a chamfer to that, and then I bring everything below that piece in a hierarchy down by a few, you know, by like a millimeter or two. This creates a stepped look that I just think looks absolutely beautiful. And the drum sander for this just comes in amazingly handy because it lets you perfectly dial things in so that I can use a router bit to add that chamfer and keep all my pieces. Still, they're safe. they stay perfectly flat because that's the whole purpose of the drum sander, but they're also perfectly thickness and nice and even. Whereas when I've done this technique in the past, they come out a little bit uneven and it is somewhat obvious to when you're looking at it, but overall, it's usually not that bad. So it's not to say that you need the drum sander to create that look, but it does definitely help and make it a little bit easier. And so the glue up for this project was what I would call an absolute nightmare. Of all the projects I've done since I got into woodworking, I have never had a more complex glue up. There's a lot of little parts, and as you can see, there's a lot of little dowels to get in place. And so what ended up happening is on one of the side panels, I completely screwed up. I glued both of the front legs to one side panel. So what I ended up having to do was cut off that one leg using this uh, somewhat sketchy method on the table saw and then reattach it with dowels. Same thing on the other panel that I didn't have a front leg for anymore. I had to go through, add dowels to that leg as well, and then just kind of hold everything together. So this is this does go to show that if you don't have something like a mortiser, you don't want to take the time to cut more tenon joinery, you could do this whole same thing with dowel joints. It's also a key thing to remember that when you're wood doing woodworking like this at this level, you are going to screw up every once in a while and you have to learn to roll the punches. Uh, when I did make this mistake, I was basically done with this project. There have been a few other mistakes here and there go leading up to this point, and so it just kind of felt like a cursed project. But luckily, I, you know, I took the time, I walked away from it for a couple days, came back and figured out a perfect solution, which in the end is not even a noticeable thing. So what ended up happening in the very end of this project, and once I actually made that repair, is that the right case on this desk is about an eighth of an inch shorter than the left one. And so with both of these cases glued up and ready to go, I could start working on the internal components. So the first thing I need to get done was the bottom panels. So both of these cases have a solid white oak bottom panel that's about three quarters of an inch thick. Now, even though on the right case, it's not necessary to have a full solid panel, I just thought it felt a little bit nicer having that solid panel in there. On the left case that's gonna be holding my computer, I did definitely need that solid panel. But again, the right case is the one with all the drawers, so we could have left it open and it wouldn't have been that big of a deal. But I like having that closed panel in there because it just makes the space seem a little bit more finished. And so with these panels, they are a frame and panel design, 
so that there's a little room for movement. Again, having panels this large in the bottom of these cases, there is definitely going to be some wood movement over the years that this thing exists. So I wanted to make sure that those middle panels had some room to move around. This is also where the drum sander just came in absolutely handy again, because it allowed me to keep these panels perfectly flat even when, I, even when they are in their finished state. I've never had this ability to keep panels like this perfectly flat uh, after doing a glue up. I've always had to rely on keeping them mostly flat with my palm sander. So the drum sander again, super handy for this thing. And so both these panels just sit on the bottom on a few little tracks that I put in through dados on the bottom stretchers. And again, super simple. For the drawers, I didn't want to use any kind of mechanical drawer slide. And so these wooden slides are going to be a lot easier to install, but also are going to be a little more future-proof because they can't really wear out, whereas, you know, ball bearing drawer slides do have that ability to wear out. From there, I could start working on the back panels. So each of these cases has a solid wood back panel, as well as the big back panel that goes between the two cases to connect them on the back. And so normally back panels are nothing super special. Most people will just throw a piece of plywood in place and move on with it. Now, in the future, I don't know really what I want to do with this desk. Uh, if I have a big home office or I have my desk stuck in a corner, it doesn't really matter. And I want to have the option to have this desk, you know, either in the middle of a room or up against a wall and not really have anything affect it. So because of that, I wanted to make sure that these back panels look just as good as everything else. So the hardware that I chose to use for the uh, larger back panel that goes between the cases was some nice uh, antique bronze coloring. Uh, and, the, and the panels themselves were built in the exact same way as the rest of the cases with those same quarter sawn walnut panels. And uh, yeah, the overall uh, the important thing was that they just look as good as the rest of the desk. There's no, when you're doing a large project like this, and again, to this level, uh, you wanna make sure that you're just not cutting corners anywhere. You wanna do everything as good as you possibly can. And so that's one thing that I really do like about fine woodworking compared to just kind of your standard woodworking is that you really want to consider every little detail possible. So whether it's something like this, where you're, you know everything down to the back panels and, and uh, case bottoms are just as nice as the rest of the construction, uh, or it's you know little fine details that you can throw in here and there. Uh, within the fine woodworking spectrum of uh, projects, there's just unlimited things you can do to make your pieces stand out. And so one thing that's worth mentioning about these back panels is that I think that they add a very important amount of strength to your cases because you're taking out a lot of the move possible movements. Especially with the larger back panel, you're really connecting those two cases in a solid way and just removing any possible movement uh, from this desk, you know, shaking side to side because those cases are moving independently. This makes them one solid structure. And so with the cases together, I could start working on the drawers themselves. Now, for these drawers, one of the things that I want to do, just design-wise, was keep these pieces as wide as possible. I didn't want to have to panel anything. I wanted to work with just solid wood pieces and avoid, you know, that paneled look. Because when you start to panel white oak, you can get some pretty chaotic different looking grains. Sometimes the uh, ray flecking from the quarters on grain will stand out too much. Sometimes your face grain will be a little bit too noisy. And it's a little bit more unpredictable. So if you're just using one solid piece, it generally is going to look a lot better. And so with tools like my bandsaw or you know ways I've been more learning to manipulate my jointer, I'm getting pretty good at working around you know using these larger pieces. And so of course on these drawers everything is going to be dovetail joinery. So for the drawer backs, I went with through dovetails because they were they're simple and fast and well it really can be it's really much easier if you go with through dovetails on the back side. And then on the front, I wanted to go with half blind dovetails because I don't like seeing joinery on the front of the drawers in this aspect. And so on this project, because I had so many dovetails to cut and this was such a hard material to work with, I tried using the table saw. Now, I have to say that I'm a little bit torn on using this method. I don't know if I like it or I hate it. Uh, part of me really doesn't like it because it just feels like cheating. Uh, but one of the benefits of the table saw is that it definitely gives a much more accurate result. You can really dial in your angles, uh, dial in your depths, and do everything really quickly and easily. But eventually I did end up resorting to going back to my handsaw because one of the things you can't do with the table saw is cut half-blind dovetails. So I think in the future, I'll probably try a whole project where I cut some through dovetails on the table saw and then get a router jig or something to cut the half-line dovetails. 
because it definitely is a lot easier when you can use more power tools for this kind of joinery. And so I will pretty much always use uh, dovetails, whether it's half line or through dovetails for my drawer joinery, just because not only is it superior to pretty much every other form of joinery, I think, but it also looks the absolute best. So that one may be in the eye of the beholder, but in my opinion, again, for any of the furniture I build for myself, I really want to utilize mainly dovetail joinery because it just looks so good. And re realistically, it is the strongest form of joint you can use for something like this. And so with all my joints fitting up nicely, I can start moving on to actually preparing these things for the glue up. So before you glue up anything that's done with dovetails, you want to make sure you take the time to finish the insides because it's quite difficult to do that. So I went through and just cleaned up all the insides up to 220 grit, made sure that they were all ready to go for finish, and then I went through and did the glue up. Again, gluing up dovetails is a fairly stressful thing to do because you have to really put in the effort to make sure you get them all fitted up nice and tight before the glue sets. And then there's the task of actually fitting them into the drawer spaces. So this is probably the most complex thing with solid wood drawers, is you really need to take the time to fit them in nicely. So with the construction like this, it's not super hard because if they're a little bit loose, you're never gonna notice. We're not going for a precise piston fit in this scenario here. Uh, most of the time, the only time you're gonna really get a piston fit is when you're working with very small drawers. So in this case, I just wanted them nice and smooth and make sure that I could pull them in and out of the drawer area very easily. Now one of the tricks I had to deal with with this white oak was that it really wanted to tear out. Even with a 50 degree blade, it just so badly wanted to tear out and leave these horrible marks everywhere. So the way that I figured out to do it was to remove the bulk of the material with the hand plane with a 40 degree blade in it and then go back in with the sander and just sand it up to 180 grit. This usually removed most of the tear out and left a much nicer finish compared to just the hand plane. And so on the top of the drawers, on the top two drawers I should say, I had to clear out this little rabbit so that they could slide around the figure eight fasteners that are going to be attaching these two cases to the desktop themselves. So that was one of the things that I didn't think about until kind of the last minute, but as soon as I went to put in the figure eight fasteners, I kind of realized that I can't push these drawers in without some form of a gap here. So that was a good kind of last minute catch. And so then it was on to the small side door. So for this door, I didn't show much progress of this in the videos because I just didn't really have a good idea of it. This was one of the areas where, which was a massive oversight on my part on this project, because my initial plan is I wanted to have this door hinged into just this one of the small openings that I had. Uh, just because I thought that it would be a little cool thing, just have a nice simple door in there. Uh, the only problem is that I didn't do, I didn't cut the hinge mortises or drill the holes for the hinges before doing the glue up, which I should have done because the problem is, is once I glued the whole case sides together, I could no longer get into that space to uh, drill you know, with a hand drill even, or to even cut the mortises for the, for the hinges themselves. So I came up with this idea to just put these two magnetic pieces on there that, and then put some magnets into the door itself, and then that holds in just fine. Again, this is not a thing that I'm gonna be using constantly, so I wasn't too worried about it. The final part of this project was the desktop itself. And so one of my goals with this desktop was to keep these white oak boards as wide as I possibly could. Uh, all three of these boards were a little over nine inches wide right from the lumber yard. And so I wanted to try and keep them at that nice wide width. What this meant though, is that I couldn't actually just use my jointer the way it's meant to. I had to use a little bit of trickery here to make everything work out. So by using my jointer to do a full six inches on one side of the board, I then attached a piece of MDF to that, and then I could pass it through my planer to get a perfectly flat face on the opposite side, and then just go through the whole planing process like normal to get everything down to its proper thickness. So it is a little bit of a dangerous uh, thing to do, and you should only do it if you're an experienced woodworker, but overall it worked out quite well in this situation. And so for the design of this desktop, what I was going for here was just to frame the white oak center area with walnut. So later on, once we get this panel all glued up, we're gonna be adding in some breadboard ends, which are also gonna be made out of walnut and are gonna be the exact same width as those walnut pieces that you can see on the side of this panel here. So this was a very interesting idea in my head and I thought it would look really cool and I'm very glad to say that in the end, it does actually look as good as I thought it would. Uh, you just get this really beautiful looking framed picture almost uh, and it just adds a little bit more visual interest to this desktop compared to if it was just solid white oak. So again, it's not something that I think is totally necessary, but it did allow me to bring in one of my favorite woods into this project in a smaller way. Building this whole desktop out of solid wa walnut would have been way too expensive for me, but being able to throw in just a few pieces of walnut around the edges as some trim 
really came out just beautifully. And so, like I said before, we were going to be doing breadboard ends on this desktop. Now, as if you guys have seen any of my other projects where I have any kind of tabletop or anything, I really am a huge fan of breadboard ends. They're something that not only do I just like the look of them, but they're also something that I really want to get good at doing so that I can just continually do them on pretty much every project because they are one of the best ways to help keep a large panel like this desktop perfectly flat. And so it's not necessary to keep a large panel like this perfectly flat. Uh, it is definitely something that is considered higher quality if you can keep it perfectly flat. But again, if you don't have the experience or you just don't want to go through the effort of putting a breadboard end on something like this, you definitely don't have to. I just like to do it because I genuinely think it looks better. So I'm not even doing it fully for the functionality, mostly just for looks. And so with that, this whole desktop is pretty much done. So the breadboard ends is definitely the hardest part of anything like this, and you definitely have a high chance of screwing it up. So that's one of the things that you have to weigh if you're doing, if your desktop itself or your tabletop is going to be super expensive, so you're making it out of solid walnut and you don't want to risk screwing up a whole thing, uh, you really got to decide, you know, you got to look at yourself and really decide how good your skills are before you do something like breadboard ends, because it's very easy to screw up an entire panel by trying to put in your breadboard ends. So just keep that in mind if you're thinking about using them in the project. It's also really important with breadboard ends that you allow for wood movement. So in some of my early projects, I didn't consider this as much. Uh, luckily, I haven't had any super bad consequences of that yet. But on this one, because this is the widest panel I've ever done with breadboard ends, I made sure to go and add a lot of movement to those dowels. So the center dowel on this panel is totally glued in place. Same with the whole tenon. There's, it's covered in glue, so it's held in place firmly. And then the other, all the other dowels are just kind of loosely held in place with a little bit of glue at the top. So this will make sure that this panel has tons of room to expand and grow uh, throughout the seasons. And so one of the things that I have noticed, because I have been using this desk for a little over a month now, uh, is that the panel has shrunk. As we've gotten closer to the winter months, uh, the panel has slightly shrunk since I brought it inside. And because I left room for that movement, there has been no issues with it so far. So again, if you're doing breadboard ends, make sure you leave that movement, otherwise you may live to regret it. And so the last part of this project is applying finish to everything. So on all of the base pieces, so the cases, the back panels, uh, bottom panels, drawers, all of those components, I use tried and true original oil, which is a combination of boiled linseed oil and beeswax. So this is a nice light duty protective finish that is not super expensive, is super easy to apply and brings out just absolutely beautiful color in both the walnut and the white oak. So one of the things that I really like about this traditional oil finish is that there is just nothing to really worry about. If you need to do any kind of repairs or refinishing in the future, it's super easy. You can just sand over an area, then apply the same oil finish again, and it just comes out looking the exact same. You don't have to worry about those finishes mismatching. The other nice thing is that there's no need to wear like a respirator or anything. Most modern finishes, you need to wear some form of respirator to stop yourself from breathing in all those toxic chemicals. And so all the base pieces on this project got two coats of the tried and true original oil. This will add ample protection for as long as this thing will exist. Uh, if I decide to go back through and refinish later on, it'll be super simple to just go in and re-add another coat. On the desktop, I went with tried and true varnish oil. So the varnish oil is a combination of pine resin and linseed oil, which just leaves a little bit of a tougher film finish. And so on the desktop, I went for three coats of this finish just because it's gonna be getting a little bit heavier use. And even though it's already a stronger finish, I just want to give it that little bit of extra protection. And so the last part of this project was one of the most stressful parts uh, was uh, transferring the holes from the top of the cases onto the desk. So you can see those little silver figure eight fasteners sticking out from the top of the cases. And so what I had to do here was basically assemble the desk upside down. So I put in the back panel that goes between the two cases and laid everything out nice and evenly on the desktop. And so then I could go through with a Sharpie, mark out my holes, and these are what I'm gonna have to drill into so that my screws don't end up splitting my nice fancy desktop here. So anytime you're drilling into a finished tabletop like this, you really wanna take it slow, take your time, and make sure you have some form of depth stop. 